Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Kathy Bryla. I am the president of Sag Moraine Native Plant Community, and I am joined here tonight by Mary Gelder, the vice president, who will you, you will see a little bit later. Uh, she's hiding in the shadows over there, making sure everything technically goes correctly. Um, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for taking some time out of your garden to talk about the garden and specifically to talk about um, how we can help those amazing monarchs in our gardens. And I hope you all have been able, have had the opportunity to see some this summer and, and have uh, many more opportunities to see some. I know that I have seen quite a few and there was one hanging out in my yard all day today. Um, every time I'd look out, this guy was was eating on something and I said, I bet he's early. He wanted to attend this webinar or he probably wanted to be part of this webinar. So um but um, I want to start, uh, in case anybody, in case this is your first webinar of ours, I want to start by introducing our organization. Um, the name of our organization is Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. We are an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit in the southwest suburbs of Chicago. Um, we... Um, basically, we try to promote native plants and ecological landscaping. Before I get any further into exactly what we do, I do want to take this time to just a quick mention of some events that we will be having uh, that we will have coming up in September. Um, the first one I want to mention, which I'm really excited about, is on September 15th with a rain date of September 16th. Um, SAG Moraine is partnering with um, the Forest Preserve District of Cook County. Uh, dark, and Dark Sky Chicago, Dark Sky International, to have our Payless Dark Sky Picnic. And um, I don't know if many of you know, but uh, the Payless area has been named um, a Dark Sky location, one of the biggest in the world. Um, or, and you can find out more on their website and you'll find out more on our website in about a week. We're gonna be going live with this. But um, this is going to be a big event. It's going to be a picnic. Uh, there will be live music. It will be at Pioneer Woods. Um, there will be other, you know, presentations. And then after dark, we'll have all have the opportunity to to view the 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 night sky from the darkness of our forest preserves. And there will be astronomers there with telescopes, which will also give us a closer view. So I'm really excited about this event. Put it on your calendar. Um, again, that is September 15th um, with the 16th as a rain date, and that'll start at five o'clock and run till 10 o'clock. It'll all be on our website, um, but not for a couple of weeks. Um, we've decided not to actively uh, take registration. You need to register for it, although it is free, but we just want to have some idea of how many will be attending. Um, so you can... Uh, you'll be able to start registering for it on July 31st. So in about a week, it should be on our website. So keep keep a lookout for that. And you'll also be getting notification of it if you're on our email, our email list. Then I also want to mention that on our next webinar will be on September 21st. And that will be with Ken Johnson uh, from the University of Illinois. And he's going to be giving his wonderful presentation about our native pollinators with a special emphasis on our native bees. And this is actually going to be a hybrid presentation. It's going to be um, presented live at Bedford Park Public Library, but it will also be our webinar. So it'll be a little bit different, shake things up a little bit. Okay, now back to a, uh, more about what we who we are at Sag Moraine. We believe that native plants are the foundation of our food chain and must become more widely utilized to improve the ecosystems that sustain all life. And because of that, we actively strive to get more native plants in our suburban landscapes. Our suburban landscapes, believe it or not, and, and urban landscapes are some of the best hope that we have for improving the health of our ecosystems and and. Um, helping our declining bees, our declining butterflies, moths, and our declining birds. Our farmlands are so filled with monoculture, uh, huge monoculture farms, no native plants left. 
tons of chemicals, so they are not a hospitable place. And actually, some of the best holdouts for our, our declining critters is our cities and suburbs. Our mission at Sag Moraine, as I said, is to restore native plants to our residential business and public landscapes. And we do this through community outreach and education. And if you haven't taken much time to look at our website, really, you know, look at our website, sagmoraine.org, see all the, the cool things that we, we are doing, all the cool things we've done in the past. And there's just a ton of information on our website if you're starting to or planning on um, planting native. Our motto at Sag Moraine is restoring our environment one plant at a time. We truly believe that a lot of people doing a little is going to have more effect than a few people doing a lot. So whatever it is, you may not have the time to, to be a gardener. You might not have the, the funds to be a gardener and to, to plant a, a bunch of natives or convert your whole yard to natives. But if you can plant a native shrub or a small pollinator garden or a native tree in your parkway, whatever small step you can take, um, collectively, we can all make a huge difference. And all of us doing this, all the, the future of all creatures depends on this. In Illinois, um, or east of the Mississippi, I should say, it's estimated that about 85% of land is privately owned. So there aren't a lot of government parks. There's not a lot of government property. It's private landowners that can really make a difference for our ecosystem and all of the creatures that depend on our ecosystem, including ourselves. And monarch butterflies depend on us doing this as well. And, and uh, they are the star of the show tonight. So I am gonna start talking about these beautiful creatures right now that um, inspire us all with their amazing migration that they take every year and just the beautiful colors that they bring to our gardens. The last yearly generation of monarch butterflies can fly up to 3,000 miles to their winter grounds. I mean, really think of those, those tiny, delicate things being able to fly 3,000 miles to their winter grounds. Then they will fly to Texas in the spring to lay their first generation of eggs. So you have a generation that flies south for the winter, then they fly, that same generation flies north to Texas they mate, they lay their eggs. Then that next generation of those eggs and, and caterpillars that were laid fl flies a little further north, and then a little further north, and then a little further north. And then the final ge generation of the season does the migration back down um, to their southern wintering grounds. They don't need GPS to do this, to, to find their migration destination. They can find, and this is just amazing to me, they can find their way to the same exact location, even the same tree where previous generations have wintered. How does this, how does this monarch that, that was bred in your yard, that, it was, that was a caterpillar on your milkweed, how is it able to find its way to, to a certain tree down in their winter grounds? And there are speculation about this, but it isn't, it isn't truly known exactly how this happens. It's probably a lot of factors that come together, but it is, it is truly amazing. And I was, I was interested when I found out that we always assume that their winter ground must be tropical with a bunch of um, you know, tropical plants down there. Actually, where they winter, um, it can snow there and it can be cold. There's something though about this environment that makes it um ideal for them to overwinter. They're not eating. They're not technically um, hibernating. They're just pretty much resting until it's time to start flying northward. In the 1990s, think of that's not that long ago. I mean, that just, I mean, to me, that just seems like yesterday. In the 1990s, there were nearly 700 million of these guys 
making this epic journey each fall from their breeding grounds in the northern plains of US and Canada to their winter grounds. And I know I'm probably mispronouncing this word to the OML fir forests north of Mexico City. That's where they all go to, um, to winter. Now, these are the Eastern monarchs that I'm talking about. There are Western monarchs that will overwinter in, in Southern California, and that those are kind of um, studied separately. So I'm talking about the Eastern monarchs, which are which is the majority, and they're the ones that make their way all the way down to um, the fir forests in Mexico, north of Mexico City. But think of that. Back then, there was 700 million doing this. Since then, the monarch population has declined by at least 90 percent. The most recent studies I have read say it's probably up around 96 percent now. 96 percent of the population is gone just since the 1990s. I know this is depressing, but there will be there will be some good news coming up. In fact, they have now been officially designated as an endangered species by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, they need help. If we, if if enough people don't band together and really try to help, this is going to be another creature that goes extinct. There's a lot of creatures that go extinct, and we don't even know it. Um, we all, all of those who are over. 30 or 40, we know that we used to see a lot more of these and that it's it's a rare treat to see them nowadays. We know we can see it and it may not directly affect your life, but do you really want a world without them? And just as an aside, this the things that we do to help the monarchs are going to help our other species as well. And the monarchs have become a poster child for what's going on. Um, in our insect world and therefore our bird world of, of them, this is a hint, not having the native plants that they need to survive and to reproduce. Um, they're the poster child, but this is going on across our, our insect population, very much so our butterflies and moths who are, um, who are, are so needed by birds to feed their young. So this is this is going on across the insect world. So whatever we do to help the monarchs is also going to help all of our other declining pollinators as well. So why why are they in such peril? I gave you a little clue before, and of course, you know, you know, we kind of drone on at Sag Moraine about native plants. So I figured you kind of figured it was had something to do with native plants. And it does. Um, but there's other factors as well. One is pesticide use. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, sometimes pesticides are necessary, not as often as they are used by far, um, but those kill non-target insects and they degrade habitat. So, you know, if you're, if you're having like some kind of an insecticide put on your lawn by a lawn treatment company or what have you, and they say, oh, it's, or something that's only supposed to kill mosquitoes, that is not true. It's going to affect all of our other insects too. And it's going to affect any of our, uh, our monarchs that land on those plants. So the indiscriminate massive use of pesticides that we, um, that we have is a big contributing factor. Development, um, as you'll see in a, in a minute, um, they rely, monarchs rely on the native plants that were um, once present in this country, and those were prairie plants. And this Illinois was the prairie state, and we were covered with mostly prairie, and that prairie is gone. And as are all of the plants that were part of that prairie ecosystem, they're gone. And urban sprawl has led to the destruction of most of their breeding lands in the US and also their overwintering lands in Mexico. And that's a whole other topic that, you know, they, there's a lot of people down there that are trying to conserve their overwintering lands. And they they do lack the funds and the resources to fight off the logging uh, that goes on. So one of the links that's going to be in the chat tonight is for uh, Journey North 
and check out that link. There are ways that we can also uh, not just help the monarchs up here at home, but help the monarchs down there in the winter. Another problem is genetically modified herbicide resistant crops. So once we started, um, you know, playing with the crops, uh, you know, genetically modifying crops that made it them more, even more deadly, the farmlands more deadly to uh, monarchs and other pollinators. These crops, they, they were able to genetically modify them so they can spray glyphosate, which is a broad spectrum herbicide, um, over and kill everything, and it won't kill these crops. So having crops that, that are so resistant to it makes it so these can be that th these herbicides can be used in in mass and um, therefore they're contaminating our pollinators and they're also removing all of the plants that our native insects co-evolved with for generations including milkweed you have to remember all of our native insects and our native butterflies and, and, and moths, they co-evolved over hundreds and thousands of years with the native plants that were present. And they learned to feed off of those plants. And most of, virtually all of our native pollinators, our native butterflies and moths have certain native plants with which they can lay their eggs and the eggs hatch and become caterpillars and the caterpillars feed on, on the plants. Um, and what have we done? We've taken all those plants away out of our landscapes and we've replaced them with lawn. We've replaced them with uh, non-native exotic plants from Europe and Asia. And um, so they don't, they, don't, they don't have these anymore so they can't reproduce. One of those plants that used to be abundant in our prairies was milkweed. And um, this is the only plant, the only plant that monarchs can lay their egg on and their caterpillars can feed upon. And I do wanna mention, I think I might've gone past one of the slides um, that I wanted to talk about because Illinois is an extremely important state when, when it comes to this. There's probably not very good chance of saving the monarchs if Illinois isn't on board. Illinois is a very large, long state, and they fly, their some of them, their migration route is right through Illinois and right through the Chicago region. And unless people in Illinois the prairie state get on board with restoring some of this milkweed back to our landscapes. Um, the future is is pretty bleak for for these amazing creatures. Uh, so we want to plant milkweed. They need that milkweed. They can't survive without that milkweed, and that that is the number one reason why their numbers are down ninety six, probably about ninety six percent. Without milkweed, monarchs can't reproduce. Plain and simple. There's no other plant that they that they have been able to adapt to. They need milkweed. They only lay their eggs on milkweed because it's the only plant with which their caterpillars can feed. And if you want to look for the eggs, the caterpillars, you know, once they get a little bit bigger, that's what what they looks like. Um, if you want to uh, look for the eggs, they're usually on the underside of a leaf. And they look, they look like a tiny little, they're kind of a cream color, but they're very tiny. They're like a pinhead. Is there anything we can do? Absolutely. Oh, here's that, that slide I wanted to show you. Illinois landscapes are critical to the future of monarchs. So when any one of us plants a batch of milkweed in our yards, we are doing an amazing thing and, and um, helping to prevent our these creatures from going extinct. You can see on this map how they migrate right through our area. So we are a really important long state for them. 
And I did want to mention, somebody had asked me earlier, how can you tell a um, male monarch from a female monarch? The male monarch, and at the end of the presentation, don't, don't uh, let me forget, I'm going to go back and show you a photo that I forgot to mention it. The male monarchs have two black dots on their hind wings, whereas the females don't. Another thing that we can do is we can avoid the use of pesticides. Now I know pesticides are sometimes necessary. I'm not gonna bury my head in the sand and, 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 and just sit here and say, don't ever use pesticides because sometimes like if you have a, a huge hornet's nest in your backyard and you have three kids, you need to do something. I mean, you, you it, it's just not, not reasonable that that you know you can't but we need to be sure that we're using the correct pesticide the the pesticide with the least collateral damage and that it is being um, applied professionally or very carefully so that there isn't a lot of peripheral damage and it really does just hit the spot that you're trying to spray it so I'm not going to say that, you know, you can't ever use pesticides, but don't just run and grab the bottle for, for, for one spider or something. I mean, really give it some thought. Do you, do I really need to put this into our environment? And if you do, you do, and just try to, to um, apply it, you know, correctly. Some other things that we can do to help monarchs. Um, is to figure out other ways other than pesticides to prevent garden pests. One way would be to pull out weak plants. Weak plants attract predators. So if you have a plant that, had, that looks like it's not doing well and it's kind of shriveling or a lot of the leaves are yellow, maybe you want to, you want to take that off because that, or pull that out or cut it down. Um, if, you're, if you plant edible plants, rotate your crops regularly every year. Uh, build healthy organic soil with compost. Uh, water early or drip irrigate to keep your foliage dry. That will do a lot to, to prevent pests. Minimize soil disturbances. Clean your pruning tools often, especially if you are cutting anything that is, is um, you suspect has some kind of pests. Avoid plants and mulch from uncertain sources. And I know, I know this is because I'm the first one to freak out if I see a snake, but I'm going to tell you, don't freak out when you see a snake. I mean, they always say snakes are a gardener's best friend. I know it's kind of creepy when we're out there working and we see a snake, but we there, what's in our garden up here in the Chicago area is not, is not poisonous unless it came from your neighbor's, you know, you know, collection or something. But um they do eat a lot of bugs and they take care of a lot of pests. So they, they are our friend. And garden diversity, one of the best things we can do is try to attract guys like this. These are native ladybugs who used to be so abundant and they too have taken a hit. And it's, it's a real treat and a rarity to see them. But the more diversity of native plants that we have in our yards, the more likely we're going to see these guys come back, ladybugs, lacewings, and the other native insects that are that control our um, predator, uh, that are that control our nuisance bugs, like you know, uh, aphids and, and such. And the best thing you can do is plant milkweed, 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 milkweed. Everybody should try to get you know three to five stems of milkweed in your yard. If everybody did that, I think we could really turn this, this trend around for the monarchs. The, luckily, there are a number of varieties of milkweed that we can choose, that we can pick from, de depending on the site where you have room for it. So I'm just gonna go over a few of those. One is butterfly milkweed. Um, this likes medium to dry soil and full sun. Uh, this is a wonderful milkweed, even, even in the front of your house, any place, because it, 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 it is clump forming, it stays small, it only gets one to one and a half feet tall, and it stays nice, small, controlled, and it has these beautiful orange flowers on it. 
Um, I will say though, it really, really wants a lot of, you know, a lot of sun. So if it's in a pretty shady place, it might not do so well or bloom bloom as well. The more sun, the more dry, the better this will perform. And then there's common milkweed. Common milkweed is much taller. It's it's usually gets about six to seven feet tall. Um, it likes dry to medium soil in full to part sun. This is the one that has much larger. They're almost like a rubbery leaf. This one, I probably don't recommend. This is grayed out in the prairie. I don't recommend it as much in smaller suburban um, landscapes uh, because it can it can be a little bit overly prolific. It can spread itself uh, more than we might like. So um, probably not the best choice for a smaller suburban landscape. Here's poke milkweed. Uh, this now, if you have a wet area in part shade to shade, this would be the one for you. Um, nice plant, three to four feet tall, uh, not aggressive. So as I said, if you have a, a shady area and you say, oh, I don't have enough sun for milkweeds, you have enough sun for poke milkweed. Prairie milkweed, uh, medium soil and full sun. This looks very similar to um, our uh, common milkweed, um, but it's much less aggressive. So this would be uh, a tall, and you can just see these milkweeds, they're gorgeous plants. I mean, they, they really are, and they're very showy in the garden. And this one has the, the, the bigger, more leathery leaves as well. So this is one um, that you can plant and, and have that taller look and not worry about, worry about it spreading. Purple milkweed, um, medium wet to medium dry soil and full to part sun. This is kind of an unusual milkweed. It's actually very rare in Illinois now. It, it's not, um, it's hard to find. It's, I guess you would call a little bit, and it's not technically on the endangered species list, but it, it, it is a, a very difficult uh, species of milkweed to find. It tends to like, um, it's, it's, supposed, it, it's, like it, it's considered to be one of the most beautiful, the flowers of the milkweeds but it tends to like sandier soil. So I, I have successfully been able to grow three stems of this, but it's because I have a raised garden bed with very loose soil. It probably wouldn't do well if I put it directly in the ground with the heavy clay that we have here. And we have this one, showy milkweed. I have to admit, I have never seen this in person, but it looks lovely. And, um, from the name of it, I'm going to assume that it is uh, dry to medium soil in full sun. And again, it's similar. The, the leaf shape and uh, texture is similar to our common milkweed, but much less aggressive. And the flowers are more two-tone pink and white as opposed to um, more solid pink of the common milkweed. And swamp milkweed which is probably my favorite because in my experience, it seems to be, in my experience, I find it to be the monarch's favorite. Um, and it's very adaptable to, um, it can do moist to wet soil, full or part sun. It's just gorgeous. The, the, the flowers smell like vanilla and it is not aggressive. So, and it, it gets about three, maybe four feet tall. And it's just a plant that works really well in our suburban landscapes and looks beautiful and smells beautiful. And it seems to be one of, if not the most favored of monarchs to lay their eggs. And don't let the, the, the name swamp milkweed scare you. It does, it does like moister soil and it will take wet soil, but um, it, it really, I mean, it, it probably, it shouldn't go two weeks without being watered, but it, um, you know, it, it's not like it's something that you have to baby out there and be watering all the time. It will take an average soil. Then there's whorled milkweed. Uh, this is a very small milkweed for dry to medium sites um, in medium soil 
in full to part sun. So this is very small, only gets to be about a foot tall and is the flowers are white, as you can see. And then this is another one that I have not seen, um, but as the name says, there's green milkweed and this grows in dry to moist soil in full sun to shade. So if there's I, I, dry to moist soil, full sun to shade, that, that pretty much covers any planting area that we have. So um, this would be a, a species that would work for you if uh, pretty much anywhere. Now, this is kind of controversial. Um, a lot of people like their tropical milkweed. And I'm going to say avoid the non-native tropical milkweed. I have seen this passed out and sold at area monarch festivals. And um, I know they mean well. And yes, the monarchs will feed on this. I'm not saying that they won't. But it is... Um, it is actually causing harm to, to monarchs. So tropical milkweed, it, it, yes, it's mostly a problem if you live in warm areas, uh, like down, down in Florida and where it does not die back in the winter. Um, there's a, a protozoan parasite, and I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that. You just read it off the screen. I'll call it OE for short. Um, it travels with the monarchs visiting the plants and they deposit this parasite on the leaves. Then when the caterpillars hatch and start eating the plant, they ingest these parasites. High OE levels in adult monarchs have been linked to lower migration success in the Eastern monarch population, as well as reductions in body mass, lifespan, mating success, and flight ability. This is according to the Zero Sea Society. Oh, there we go. We don't have this problem with native. Let me just see. I don't, I want to be sure I didn't miss a no. Oh, maybe I missed something. We don't have this problem with our native milkweeds because they die back. After they bloom, they die back. The leaves start to brown, the leaves start to fall off, and which doesn't allow these OE levels to get high and to build up. So you could say, well, it really isn't a problem in Illinois because they're going to die back here anyway, because they're, they, they mean, obviously, yes, they, they are, they can, you know, the, the tropical milkweed can survive the winter in the tropics, but it's still going to die back here. So what's the difference? Why can't we plant it in Illinois? Well, it because it blooms longer than our native milkweeds when planted in northern areas, and it can confuse our monarchs and cause them to keep breeding when they really should be migrating. So there's so many lovely species of native milkweed that there is um, there's no we, you know, no reason to be um, choosing this one. So our native milkweeds, none of them are orange and yellow. So if you're ever anywhere and you see a milkweed and it's orange and yellow, um, it's it's not the best choice. Now let's talk. A lot of people ask me, what are these awful bugs on my milkweed? Oh my God, I gotta get my pesticide spray out. Um, and you can even see, you see in that picture, there's a little monarch egg on the leaf right in front of the milkweed bug. Um, if you have milkweed, you're going to have milkweed bugs. Um, they, they go hand in hand. They, they feed solely on milkweed. They might look a little shocking and a little creepy. This is this picture to the right is them in various uh, stages of, of their life. You know, the younger ones are more than nymphs. This is more of, of a larger adult. Um, but they um, they can look a little startling until you get used to them. They're completely harmless, and they um, they feed they suck the juices out of and feed off of the seed pods and the seeds within the seed pods that form. They don't go after the leaves. They don't harm the plants. They don't harm 
the monarch eggs or the monarch caterpillars, and they don't even compete for the same part of the plant that the monarchs are looking for. So, so don't worry about them and certainly don't spray pesticide on them because they will, um, you know, because then that's going to harm the monarchs. I do want to mention, I don't have a photo here, but anybody who has grown milkweed knows that we have, um, that there is a non-native aphid that always seems to present itself on, on a lot of our species of milkweed. Um, they can be annoying. They don't usually kill the plant, um, but they they can um, make it lose a lot of leaves, make, it, make the leaves wilt, make it probably less likely to be a host for a host choice for a monarch. Um, they, the best thing you can do with those is, you know, even, even a soapy solution, they always said spray with the soapy solution. You know, how do we know how that dish soap solution really is going to affect the monarchs? And they probably aren't going to choose to lay eggs if there's some soapy residue on our, on our plants. The best thing you can do for them is to periodically hose your plants down so that and that will make a lot of them drop. They're not as adhered to the plants as as the as the monarch caterpillars are. So um, just try to you know hose them periodically to to rinse some of them away so that they don't get you know too too out of control. And then you know again the more native diversity that we have in our gardens, the more likely we're going to have the predator bugs, the ladybugs, um, and you know, you get a, a good population of of those in your your garden, the the native crane mantises, the you know native lace wings, and and so on. You're not going to have um, as big of a problem with aphids, native or non-native. So let's say we have we just um, we had our milkweed, and we successfully had um, monarchs lay eggs on the milkweed, and then they. Uh, the mon the the um, the eggs hatched and it became caterpillars and they they were feeding on there for a couple weeks and then they went into their chrysalis and a week or two later they came out and they're an adult monarch so now we need to feed them the mon the monarch adults um, they will feed uh, they're they're looking for nectar from flowers and they will feed off the nectar from milkweed plants but now they are easier to please when they're trying to breed and lay their eggs and, and the caterpillars, they can only use milkweed. Once they're adults, there are a number of plants that they can use, including this uh, native thistle that we see here for their food. And I wanna go over some of the native plants that are considered to be some of their favorites to feed on. And as I'm going through them, take a look at, um, pay attention to the colors of the plants and you'll see a real similarity to give you an idea of what colors seem to attract monarchs. So the first one is wild bergamot. Um, wild bergamot is loved by, um, it, it has a nickname of bee balm because it's just loved by bees. I had so many, as mine was uh, blooming and it still is blooming just an amazing array of, of different species of um, bees, our native bees and bumblebees, but it is also loved by our butterflies and our monarchs. It gets to be two to five feet tall. It'll grow in full to part sun, dry to moist soil, and uh, it blooms in June, July, August. So a very, very adaptable plant. It can have a tendency to get a mildew issue. Um, so Again, any plants that, that are prone to that, best to water in the morning and best to water um, at ground level and not from above. Hori verve. This is our native verbena. Many people have planted non-native verbena in pots for years. This is, this is our native variety. It gets to be two to four feet tall. It likes full sun, dry to medium soil, and this also also blooms in June. I mean, in July, August, and September. Big big monarch months. Again, purple. Here we have ironweed. 
This grows four to six feet tall, gets kind of tall, a little bit leggy, um, but beautiful flowers. And um, I planted, a, a. I had a side of my garage that was between my garage and a fence. And I would have to try to get back there with the lawnmower. And I said, I'm just going to take out this lawn. It's, it's an area maybe three feet wide and 10 feet deep. So I took out I took out the lawn there and I just filled it in with ironweed because ironweed is um, tough and it can take a lot of water, like moist soil. So it can take the, the water that, that runs off the garage roof. And it's just beautiful over there. And when that stuff is blooming, which it's about to bloom anytime within the next week, loaded with pollinators, really pretty. Lavender hyssa. Um, I can't say enough about this plant. It's not a pollen plant. And again, pollen is what they need to, you know, bees and others need to feed their young. It's a nectar plant. But when this, when, when lavender hyssop is blooming, it is definitely the favorite plant in, in, in the garden. And then, then the, when they're done with the flowers, then the goldfinch come to eat the seed heads. So it's just, it's, it's really a plant that does a lot of service to our, our environment and it blooms for a very long time and, and just, is just a really pretty plant. Gets two to four feet tall, full to part sun, medium to dry, dry soil. And again, it blooms in July, August, and September. Oops. Sorry. Where are you? Okay. New England aster, another purple. Asters are really, uh, are very important plants for our native pollinators and specifically our monarchs because they bloom late. They bloom August, September, October. They provide a lot of nectar for our monarchs to be able to fuel up um, for their journey south to Mexico. Um, it grows three to six feet tall, full to part sun, medium to moist soil. Um, this sets its flower buds later in the season. So if you if you don't want it to get to the higher height, like six feet, um, you can keep this plant shorter and, and asters in general because they bloom late, they set their buds late. You can cut this back to, you know, in July. I cut mine back like the first week of July, cut it almost in half and it still, then it sets its flowers on a shorter, more compact plant. I cut mine back probably by about a third. So here we have a pop of yellow in here, but monarchs do love um, oxide sunflower. They love sunflowers in general, whether they be our um, non-native annual sunflowers or our uh, native sunflowers, our perennial sunflowers. And they love this oxide sunflower. Uh, grows three to six feet tall, dry to moist soil, full sun, Again, blooms June, July, August, and September. It's a perennial, but not a true sunflower. Prairie Blazing Star. Um, gorgeous plant, always butterflies on it when it's blooming. I just saw the, the beginning, the, be, the be, very beginning of some pink buds forming on it today. So it's coming. It blooms July and August. Uh, it likes medium to moist soil, goes, grows three to five feet tall. Purple coneflower. My purple coneflowers have been going crazy this year. They're just something, they're loving something out there because they are just, you know, full of blooms and the the butterflies are all over them. And if if there's anybody out there, like a lot of people will ask, I was thinking this as I was, you know, walking by one day, I was, if, if a lot of people will say, well, I want to help the butterflies, but I'm allergic to bees. So I don't want a lot of bees around. And I've noticed in my garden that I see a lot of bees on my monarda, a lot of bees on my hyssop. I see some bees on the on the coneflower, but I have to say coneflower really, really seems to be a favorite of butterflies 
and not a favorite of bees. They'll go there, but I, it doesn't seem to draw a tremendous amount of bees. I, I occasionally see a bee on there, but I, I don't, I don't, you know, often. But I see, but every butterfly that, that travels through the area goes on the purple cone flower. Three to four feet tall, full to part sun, medium to dry soil, very adaptable, blooms July, August, and September. Showy goldenrod. This is another, another one of the yellow plants that they like. This is another very important plant. It's a, along with asters, it's a keystone plant in our area. Keystone means that it is that it has a very high um, level of importance in our ecosystem. Uh, so if you want to plant plants, if you don't have a lot of space and you want to plant some plants that give you the most bang for your buck in regards to the, the ecosystem services that they provide, asters and goldenrods are, are great candidates. Some asters, some goldenrods can be a little bit too aggressive uh, for smaller gardens. So uh, we, we don't recommend them, but showy goldenrod is um, a species that is much more well-behaved and, and much less um, you know, aggressive and, and that is very appropriate and very lovely in, in uh, suburban gardens. And it is, um, again, very important for those migrating monarchs in, in the fall. Gets one to three feet tall, likes full sun. I've seen it growing fine in, in part sun, but it, it prefers definitely full sun and I'm sure flowers better. Medium to dry soil and it blooms August, September. Um, yeah, August and September. Smooth aster. Um, smooth aster is, is a, a form of aster that is much less aggressive as well. So if you're, if you want a, a an aster that really plays nice and stays in its place as, as much as possible. Not to say you won't ever have one spread, but it's not, it's not as uh, readily as some other species of aster. Uh, and it's just absolutely lovely. Um, this grows two to four feet tall, full sun, medium to dry soil, and it blooms very late, really helps those migrating monarchs in August, September, and October. And sweet Joe pie. I guess this one is a little bit pinker like milkweed. Um, and this is a great plant and it also is a keystone in our area. And it gets four feet, four to six feet tall. It's a nice, it's, it's a nice tall plant that would be great for like the back of a border, along a fence, uh, just really lovely. Um, very adaptable. Um, it, it can grow in part shade to shade. So if you have some shady areas that are difficult, this that but you but you know you want to help the pollinators, but you don't have a lot of sunny areas, this would be a good one to to try out. Uh, it likes medium moisture soil, and it blooms in August and September. And I do want to mention there are you know sometimes we have periods in our garden where we're in between things that are blooming. And um, so uh, supplementing with some annuals in containers is not a bad thing. And, and it can be readily used by monarchs as we want to be sure though that they're from a reputable grower and they don't contain um, things that like, that are going to, you know, be harmful. To our monarchs, I, I wouldn't necessarily ever recommend getting things at big box stores as much. Go to more of a reputable garden center. But some of the the um, annuals that um, that they like the best, that you'll attract the most with, are our annual sunflowers, zinnias. I have to say, every time that I have monarchs in my yard they are on the zinnias I always plant a bunch of zinnias just for them they just they're they're crazy about zinnias um lantana is a favorite of theirs they they very much like lantana and cosmos so if you don't have and if you don't let's say you live in a condo or a townhome and you don't have any property to plant in the ground but you want to try to do what you can to help the monarchs 
plant some containers of some of these plants, um, you know, plant some containers of, you know, zinnias or lantana or cosmos and, and give them the nectar that they need to feed on during the breeding season. Another thing we can do to help the monarchs, again, going back to their wintering area, is buy FSC certified wood. Um, it's certified by the Forest Stewardship Council to deter illegal logging in monarch winter grounds. So try to ask if you're building or doing a project, ask at your, at your lumber supplier if it is FSC certified wood. Avoid chemical fertilizers. Um, try to use organic fertilizers if you need fertilizer, but one of the many wonderful things about native plants is if you plant native, do not fertilize them. They don't need to be fertilized. They evolved with our soil. They like our, what we might consider crappy clay soil. They love it. They're happy in there. So they don't want they don't want any added fertilizer. They like it just fine as it is, which can be shocking to us because we've all, you know, as gardeners, we've all spent years trying to stand on our head and do three cartwheels and and fertilize our hydrangeas just to get one bloom. And, and it's just not with native plants. They, they like the soil as is. And I want to also tell you, please, you can... Check out more on our website, um, visit sagmoraine.org and support the work of Sag Moraine. Um, you can do this by becoming a member, get on our email list so that we can give you, um, inform, you know, keep you up to date on events or things that we are, we have going on. We love our volunteers. We are a growing organization. We have grown exponentially this year, and we are going to be looking this fall on expanding our leadership and our board of directors, we need to, to increase it, to increase the, um, to, to match the, what we are doing as an organization. So please consider volunteering, um, watch for the latest news and events, attend our free community webinars and follow us on social media. Got a lot going on on social media. So we talk so much about planting native and planting milkweed, but where do you get it? Uh, that is that is the the number one question. Um, not easy to get, unfortunately. I wish we could just always walk into a garden center or walk into a big box store and there was a bunch of healthy um, native plants there for the picking that we could go get at any time. Unfortunately, that is not that that is not the reality. Although the more we as consumers demand native plants, if 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 it's going to make them money, they will they will carry it. So, you know, when you're in, when you're in any store, it doesn't hurt to go up and say, Hey, do you have native plants? Or do you have, you know, such and such native plant? If, if they feel like there's a demand, they will start carrying more and more of these. There are some local native garden center. I mean, garden centers that, that do carry some native plants. I know sunrise out South. I'm, I'm it's escaping me now. What, what the name of the town that that's in, if anybody, um, remembers the name of the town, please put that in the, um, the q and A. I I can't remember the town, but also the growing place out in Naperville and Aurora carries some, but most of the places you're not going to find any natives. And you have to really watch, even if it says native, it may not be native, it might be a cultivar of a native plant. Is that probably still better for our pollinators than a non-native plant? I would guess probably, but I defer to, to botanists who, and, who, and entomologists who know more than I, but I would guess it is, but it has still been found not to be as nutritious and not to be as appealing to our native pollinators as the true native species. And the way you can tell this is if you're looking at a native plant, and let's say you're looking at blue hyssop, and it should say, you know, blue hyssop, and then it should give you the Latin name. If it also gives you an, another name like blue fortune, and it's in quotations, then you know that it is a cultivar of a native plant. 
So where can you get them? Online, if you want to order native plants online, two places that are, you know, have very high quality plants and are, are wonderful places to do business with. Our Prairie Nursery, which is in Wisconsin, and Prairie Moon Nursery, which is in Minnesota. Um, and the best time, even though they're past now, uh, but sometimes you see one pop up in the fall, our local spring plant sales. Um, we had ours on June 3rd, so always watch for your local spring plant sales. Mary, would you mind finding um, the link to the um, Illinois Native Plant Society? Because they always keep a list of plant sales uh, that are that are going on, and there is a chance that there will be uh, some in the fall still. So um, that's probably one of the best places to to get native plants because they buy a lot of our our native plant growers are wholesale only, and they're growing native plants for larger projects and larger restorations. So organizations like Sag Moraine and others will have a plant sale so that we can get large quantities of plants from a wholesaler and be able to sell individual plants to the, the homeowner consumer. So a quote that we have on our website, which I love by Sarah Stein, we cannot in fairness rail against those who destroy the rainforest or threaten the spotted owl when we have made our own yards uninhabitable. So let's really take a look. We're not saying again, remove all of your lawn. We need some lawn. I understand if you have kids, if you have dogs, you want some lawn. But look around your property and see, is there any place on this property that I could help the monarchs out? Is there any place where I could put an area of good uh, nectar plants for for migrating monarchs? Is there an area that I can put some milkweed to help monarchs, uh, to help them to breed? Is there something I can do? We, we want to try to avoid having a yard like this that has absolutely no ecosystem value at all because lawn really services nothing um, when it comes to our, our local ecosystem. Leave you with a beautiful picture of a monarch on milkweed. Look at that. And do we have any questions? I, Mary's going to pop on now so you don't just have to see my face and just hear my voice because that must be really monotonous by now. <laughs> it's not monotonous. And I'm not seeing your video at all, Kathy. Are you seeing mine now? I am. I see you. Okay. I don't know. I don't see you. I don't see you. I haven't been seeing you, but maybe others have. Oh. <laughs> You poor oh, people, you if you haven't been seeing oh, me. Oh, you know what? I think I think you've just been hidden behind. Sorry, that's my bad. <laughs> yes, there are some questions. And you actually answered a couple of them. But uh, how about this? Will monarchs lay eggs on milkweeds with aphids on them? So my, my experience is, yes, they will on the plant if there's aphids somewhere on the plant. But I don't ever find eggs on leaves and areas of the plant that have an aphid population right there. So that's why if your whole plant gets, and it can happen, it can happen to those, those, I mean, remember those orange aphids that go after milkweed, they are not native. And um, so it can happen. That's why I, I do recommend maybe hosing trying to hose some off so it doesn't get out of control because because they they don't seem to lay eggs if there's a big population right there. So if they're everywhere on your plant, you probably won't get eggs. This is from my experience. Okay. Uh, Zach wants to know, what if he wants to tear out my lawn and turn it into a native landscape? He really wants to start that next year. So do you have any advice for him? Yay! Help Zach. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And well, I do see here that Eve, you said Sunrise in Grant Park, Illinois. That's a place. Sunrise Nursery in Grant Park, Illinois does carry true natives and a decent selection of them. It's a little bit far out south. Um, and it also can be called, yeah, to, Tina, I always I always forget how to pronounce that. Wold who is Wold House. <laughs> Good German name or something. Um 
So who is it that wants to go on there? Zach. Zach? Yeah. Awesome, Zach. So so you're going to take a you're planning on taking out all of your lawn and your yard and going all native. Um couple recommendations I would have. Um depending on how much time you have, sometimes it's best to do it in in sections and segments so that it because even though in the long run, um, native plants need less work, less upkeep than non-native plants because those root systems go so deep that in a year or two after planting, you're not gonna need to water as much and they don't need to be fertilized. But when they're all babies, they still need to be watered and taken care of. So depending on how big your yard is, maybe doing it, I, I would I would probably recommend doing it in phases over two or three years. Um, and there are different ways that you could, um, you know, get rid of your lawn uh, that that would would make it so you don't have to to dig it all up if you if you start ahead of time and you start doing some using some cardboard and st mulch and stuff to kill off the lawn. But you know, go on on Sag Moraine, or I'm going to give you. Can you put my email address in the in the Q and A, Mary? Send shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to talk with you and give you some other. Um, some other advice or send you to some resources that can help you with that because um, that's a big endeavor. And I thank you so much for doing that. You're going to create a, a little national park right on your property. I love it. And I, and I want you to know, I, other than my parkway, I did all, I've converted to probably 70% native, 30% non-native in my front yard, took the lawn out and it is gorgeous. And Everybody is walking by saying how much they like it. Nobody has run to the mayor to complain and they're complimenting it. So <laughs> it can be done really well and inspire just, our neighbors. I also want to point out that uh, we have a YouTube channel and I just put the link in the chat to the YouTube channel. And our last webinar a month or two ago was Benjamin Folks and he gave some suggestions on yes, how to did. start a native garden, uh, a native plant garden as well. So uh, you might just video, uh, visit those uh, those YouTube videos from our past webinars and see if there's something there that, that might be helpful. Perfect, good point. And, and Marilyn and Nancy said, I wasn't aware um, that it was this week, but that's awesome. So Possibility Place, who is one of those um, uh, wholesale growers, uh, and you usually have to order things like, you know, you might, you may have to order a plant in a larger quantity. You can, you can mail order from them, but usually you have to order like, you know, a flat of something, but they are there. They are where we get our plants for our plant sale. They have beautiful, beautiful plants and they are having a pop-up sale where the, uh, where consumers can go this weekend this Friday and Saturday. So that is at Possibility Place in Moni. So if you're if you're inspired or motivated by this and you want to get out there and get some milkweed, and they have a number of different varieties of milkweed, um, you know, head out to Possibility Place this weekend. Oh, I'm sorry, it's tomorrow and Friday, not Friday and Saturday. <laughs> uh when will monarchs lay the last generation of eggs that will migrate south? It's around, usually it's because it takes about two weeks for, you know, maybe a, a up to a week for them to hatch, three days to a week for them to hatch. Then they're a caterpillar for probably a good two weeks and they're a chrysalis for about two weeks. So most of that is going on, I would say, in August, early September. Um, but I have to say that last year I was I was raising some monarchs, you know, um, trying to in in little net houses, and I I released some in early October. So and and they I was finding eggs still in early September. 
So yeah. do you recommend rescuing the mon monarchs and raising them in a protected environment, Kathy? That is a very good question. I I, I don't know. I, 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 I did it because my... Um, my wasps were eating all the eggs and I wanted to give some a chance. And I think in, in, the, in an ideal world, we would not have to do that because there would be plenty of food for the wasps and plenty, and, and we wouldn't have, but we have this species that's dying out. And when you, when you see the wasps following it around and eating the eggs as soon as they lay it, it just breaks my heart. And then I found out that even flies will eat the eggs. So I, I was like, oh my God, how, is, how are we ever gonna do that? So, but, but I don't advocate purchasing. So if you're doing it at home and you're doing it conscientiously and you're putting cuttings in water and you're, you're making sure that you don't, have, you don't have too many on a stem and you're keeping your nets clean, it is an endeavor to do it well. So if you're not going to do it well, I would say don't do it because then they can they can get a fungus and they can get sick and they can spread that. So if you and and I don't recommend those mail order ones because you don't know how those rates and it's and it's stressful on them. And then if they if they are diseased and weak, then they can spread it to others. So I know I didn't really answer the question, but I, I think that's probably something that people have to you know make a judgment on how much time they have correct if you're going to do it right and if they're going to do the research on how to do it i get you got to do your research on how to do it and you got to keep it clean you know <laughs> so you just you don't want to so it, and then like i said it, it's it's an endeavor but if it's done well it is very rewarding to know that that you you know i think last year i released 25 and yeah. um Wow. I, I probably maybe would have hit, you know, none or one or two with, I had a lot of wasps last year. I don't know why I'm not seeing near as many this year, but, but last year for some reason, and uh, they were all being, being, you know, devoured. Oh. Um, Tina said that Will County Forest Preserve Foundation is also having a pop-up native plant sale the 29th and the 30th. Yeah. Good. I put some of that information from the from those tips in the chat. Wonderful. So we'll have that information. Uh, Kathy, does milkweed support other species besides monarchs? Do you know? Yes. You mean as far as as eggs and um, or just they feed is off? There a, is there a reason why we would plant milkweed besides just the monarchs? I mean. There are, uh, there are a lot, it is, is a, it is a favorite pollinator, I mean, uh, nectar and pollen plant for uh, many species of pollinators. So yes, I mean, you'll, if, if you plant milkweed, you're not only going to see monarchs going to it, you're going to see a number of different types of butterflies, moths, and bees. So it is a wonderful, um, a wonderful nectar plant as well. When you say to plant annuals such as zinnias in a container, why would you want to plant it in a container? Is there a reason not to plant them directly in the ground? No, I guess you could plant it in the ground, but I said that because a lot of people say, oh, I want to help, but I can't, but I don't, I live in a condo. I don't have room. I can't, I can't plant in the ground. Oh. So that's where, you know, planting a container of some of these annuals can really be helpful. But you know, you can certainly plant them in the ground as well. Some of the ones I mentioned, like lantana and so on, I've never tried to plant those in the ground. I don't know how they do. And I and and you know, so I'm not sure how they will do in the ground. Well, but but we, zinnias will do well in the ground. How about we flip that and ask, can we plant native plants in containers? Theoretically, yes, there are some species that do well, and I would recommend that people go on our YouTube channel and look for our presentation, Restoring Our Environment One Plant at a Time. We have a, a, a section there where we talk about some native plants, and I can't remember what ones they are right now, but native plants that do well in containers uh, because not all native plants do well in containers. Again, one of the beauty of, of native plants is that they are their, their root systems are very deep. They go deep. They don't have 
a invasive roots. I mean, they they go very deep. They're fibrous, though. So they're not like tree roots where, you know, you don't want to plant it near your foundation or anything. They're not destructive at all like that, but they do go very deep. Some native plants, their roots will go down 15, 20, even as much as 30 feet. So obviously that would not work in a container, but there are some species that don't have quite as deep of root systems that, that have been found to work well in containers. And again, if you go to our, our Restoring Our Environment One Plant at a Time on our YouTube channel, um, we go over that on there. Okay, thank you. Uh, my milkweeds tend to fall over. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so one of the things that will make milkweeds and native plants in general fall over is if you are either watering them too much, but or if the ground, this is a big one, if the ground is too fertile. Again, I can't stress enough, our native plants do not want fertilizer. So if you make the ground too fertile and you're fertilizing them, they will be more likely to fall over. Also, they will fall over if they're not getting enough sun. So most, you know, if, if you really are more of a part shade area and you're trying to grow a milkweed that likes full sun to part sun and it's leaning over, it might be reaching for the sun. And oh. so, um, you know, you really, if that's the case, you want to assess, do you really have at least, you know, four hours of direct sun in this area a, a day. If not, maybe you want to go with one of the milkweed species that can take shade that we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the other thing that you can do is, again, remember native plants are, you know, they came from the prairie and think of what prairies were like, you know, we're, we're used to traditional landscaping that we've been doing for the last several decades where you put in a plant and then you put in a big section of mulch. And then you put another plant and then you put a big section of mulch. Native plants are meant to grow close together. So you really want to plant those plants six to eight inches apart. And they grow up as a community and they hold each other up. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're planting some of these plants and you're leaving a bunch of space around them, they might fall over. But if you're, you're clustering them in a beautiful garden, they're all working together to hold each other up. That's a good point. I want to show you those dots because people often, and I'm sorry if this is nerve wracking to be back, going back to uh, the different slides, but I forgot to show you the dots on a milkweed, I mean, on a, on a monarch that tell you whether it's a male or female. Um, and it's pretty easy to see when, you, when you're looking at one. Let me move this over. There we are. You see those dots on the hind wings here and here, mm -hmm. right alongside the the um, the torso. If they have those two dots, it's a male. The females won't have that. I did not know that. So thank you for pointing that out. I've often wondered. So. Uh, any other any questions? Other, any, any other questions? Uh, oh, wait. Just scroll down. Um, mm -hmm. I have uh, ditch lilies in my yard. Should I try to remove them? I understand they are an invasive species. Are you familiar with ditch lilies? Kevin? So I'm thinking those are the that, that common orange lily, the common orange lilies. Um, yeah, they are an invasive species, and, and we don't, we don't, try to ask people to go 100% native, you know, that's, that's, you know, probably too much for, for the average homeowner to take on, to, to completely, you know, redo their, their entire yard and in, in native plants. Although if you can do it, you know, I've pretty much done it, but if you can, but if, if you're so inclined, but what we don't want is for people to think that in order to make a difference, you have to do that. You can make a difference with one plant. Um, but we do ask people to remove invasive species. Invasive species have really become a problem um, for a lot of our natural areas, for our forest preserves. A lot of the ones we think of are trees and shrubs like pear trees and, and um, 
burning bushes and some of the other invasive uh, species that people are still planting. Um, but yes, those those common orange lilies are considered invasive. They do tend to take over areas. So if you if you want to do the best for the ecosystem, do try to get rid of, of any invasive species. Yes. Why did I think there was another question down there and I lost it? Well, it was a <laughs> it was a question that I answered myself. Oh, okay. Okay. Um is there anyone else who has a question? Any other questions going once, going twice? I will say this, the, the question that I answered was, uh, we have, and this is in, in, someone pointed out that they're not able to copy the our links in the chat because we disable it. And I didn't know that, I wasn't aware of that. So- uh, Well, that's if, good to know. If you are wanting to see the, the have a copy of those, Links. We always post them when we post the recording of the videos in our um, in the YouTube channel. So when we post this, we'll also be posting all of the links that we that we posted here. So yeah, we'll have to talk about that, Kathy, and maybe in the future we'll. Yeah, we'll have to figure out. That's good to know. Nobody's ever informed us of that before, so we've been we've been clueless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks again, everybody, for attending. And um, again, enjoy your gardens and help those monarchs. If, if you know Illinois is an important state, if we all if we all work together and get some milkweed in the ground, I I really think we can turn it around for these guys. So I'm, I'm going to remain hopeful. So um, happy planting, happy summer, and we will see you for our events in September. Bye. Bye.